you have a Bible with you, I invite you to take it and open to the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 4 this morning together, Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, it is Christmas time. It is uh, also uh, college football championship, conference championship time. And uh, we're enjoying that. If you're a football fan, how many of you are Baylor fans this morning? Anybody excited about uh, the Big 12 championship? Any Georgia fans? <laughs> They're really Auburn fans. How about Alabama? Anybody, from, uh, anybody for Alabama? Okay. All right. So you've had an interesting weekend. Um, uh, you know, when you watch a football game, I always enjoy, uh, particularly when a, a, a particular team is down and uh, let's say it's the middle of the fourth uh, quarter and sometimes you'll just see a quarterback uh, call together a huddle and he'll get his guys together who are, they're exhausted, they're tired, they're ready to quit. Uh, it's almost the end of the game. And you'll see sometimes that quarterback just get right in the middle of that huddle and he starts preaching to them. He starts uh, inspiring them, motivating them, telling them, don't quit. Don't give up. Uh, the game's not over yet. We're, we're almost there. Let's, let's, uh, let's fight. Let's, uh, let's keep going. And uh, when, when I read the book of Hebrews, that is really one of the images that comes to my mind. The author of Hebrews is writing to the church at Rome, and they are all exhausted. They're tired. They're ready to give up in their faith. And the author of Hebrews is calling a huddle in this epistle, so to speak, to say, don't give up. I know you're tired. Uh, we're not at the finish line yet. Keep fighting. Keep pursuing Christ. And this is an inspiring book. It's a, motivation, a, a motivational book. It's the author of Hebrews telling Christians who are in danger of quitting and giving up in their faith to run with endurance the race that is set before you. Don't quit before you finish. And that's a relevant message for each and every one of us today because in our walk with Christ, we can go through discouragements, we can go through difficulties where we are just frankly tired and we just wanna quit, we wanna throw in the towel. And Hebrews is written to say, don't quit in this race of faith until you've reached the finish line. Now the author, to, to encourage the church at Rome in this way, to endure, he does a couple of different things. First of all, he gives positive affirmations of who Jesus is. And so this book, throughout the book, you have um, these beautiful uh, passages that really lift Jesus up for you, that shows you who Jesus is and what he's done. So like in chapter one, we see that he is a, a better word. He is greater than the prophets. He's greater than the angels. He is the exalted son of God. In chapter two, he is the greatest human to ever live. Uh, throughout the book, you're gonna see he's better than Moses. He's better than the priesthood. He is superior, he's better. And so you have these great passages where the author just holds Jesus up for you to behold. And that should motivate you to continue to run after Christ through the finish line. But then the other way that the author motivates endurance is through warning. And so littered throughout the book, you have these warning passages where the author says, don't shrink back, don't turn away, don't drift, warnings about what happens if you quit before you finish. And, and actually, when you come to Hebrews chapter four, you find both of these things. You find warning, you also find a positive affirmation of who Christ is. And both of those are intended to motivate you to endure in your race of faith. So let me just remind you of kind of where we've been a little bit. In chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, you have this warning that is given. And the warning goes something like this. The author talks about the fact that one day every single one of us will stand before God who is the judge. And his word, which is alive and is powerful, will be a judging word that will lay us bare when we stand before him. That the, the word of God, this judging word, is like a sword that separates joints and marrow. And before God, even the thoughts and intents of our heart will be laid bare. Now, folks, that is quite a warning the warning that one day you will stand before the God who made you 
and you will give an account for your life, not only how you lived, but even the thoughts and the intentions of your heart. And God's word will lay us bare. Now, in light of that warning, what hope do any of us have? In, in light of this impending, judging word that will expose the thoughts and intents of our heart. What hope do we have? Well, I'm really thankful that the author doesn't stop at verse 13. He gives us verses 14, 15, and 16. Verses 14, 15, and 16, the author of Hebrews is saying, listen, in light of this impending, judging word of God that will lay us bare, we have a great high priest named Jesus. So in verses 14 through 16, we have this positive affirmation of who Jesus is. And in this paragraph, we have great hope. And so I want to encourage you this morning. I want you to see a couple of things about this passage. The author is going to give us two truths about who Jesus is. And then he's going to give us two ways to respond to those truths. So he's going to say, this is who Jesus is. Now I want you to respond to him. And then he's going to give us a second truth and then give us a second way to respond. So let's look together at the text. I want to read it through and then we're going to walk walk through the text together. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, and let's begin reading in verse 14. It says, therefore, right, so in light of what has come before, in light of this warning about the judging word of God, therefore, on that basis, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, That's a truth. We have a great high priest named Jesus who's passed through the heavens, the very Son of God. Now look at the invitation to respond. Let us hold fast to our confession. Verse 15 gives us a second truth. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. So truth number one, we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. How do we respond? Let us hold fast to our confession. Truth number two, we don't have a priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Now look at how he invites us to respond. Look at verse 16. Notice the parallelism here between verse 14 and verse 16. He says, therefore, let us approach the throne of grace. Verse 14 said us, says, let us, draw, let us hold fast to our confession. Verse 16, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace grace to help us in our time of need. So I want you to see two truths about Jesus from these three verses, and then two invitations, two ways to respond to the truth that we see about Jesus. Here's the first truth that the text teaches us, and that is this, that we have a priest who saves. We have a priest who saves. The text tells us that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Now, let me just talk about that for a moment. We don't often think about priests. In our Baptist life, our Baptist tradition, uh, priest, the word priest is almost a bad word. If you come from a Catholic background where there's a priest that you go to and make a confession and this kind of thing, then maybe even using the word priest may trigger you a little bit. But actually, it's a mistake not to use that word because that's a Bible word. And it's a word that describes Jesus. The Bible says that he is a priest. Now, in the Old Testament, God set aside, you know, you have 12 tribes of Israel. God set aside one tribe, the tribe of Levi. And out of this tribe, God would call priests to minister on his behalf to the people of Israel. And out of these priests, if you were a Levite, you could qualify to be a priest. Out of those priests, 
there would be one priest who was called the high priest. And he would have a, a set assignment. He would have distinct responsibilities. He was the head honcho. He was the big cheese. He was the chief kahuna. Uh, the high priest was in charge of all the other priests. And <clears throat> he had certain responsibilities. In fact, all of the priests had certain responsibilities. The high priest had unique responsibilities. But notice how Jesus is described here in this text. He is our what? great high priest. And so let me talk with you just for a few minutes about priests and what priests did. In the Old Testament, priests had three responsibilities. First of all, they were to represent God to the people. Second of all, they were to represent the people to God. And then third, they were to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. Okay, those were the three responsibilities of a priest. Represent God to the people, represent the people to God, and then offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. Now, I, I want to talk with you about that and, and show you how Jesus is a priest, but he is a great high priest. He's an even better priest than the Old Testament priest. So let's just talk about each of those three things. Priests were to represent God to the people. Now, <clears throat> there are all kinds of people in the Old Testament who represented God uh, to the people. For instance, like prophets. Uh, prophets would come and represent God to the people. They would come and they would bring this message from God. So think about like uh, Jonah, for instance. God calls Jonah to be a prophet to go to Nineveh, and he is going to represent God to Nineveh. He is going to preach and deliver a message. He is a, a representative of God. Um, some of you, uh, probably most of you in this room are too young to remember this. Uh, I'm certainly too, run too young to remember this, but some of you may remember the time and the day when churches used to have uh, traveling evangelists come into a church, and sometimes they would do a week-long or two-week-long uh, evangelistic like revival. How many of you remember those days? Okay, quite a number of you. So <clears throat> here's, here's the thing about a, a prophet. A prophet kind of was like a, a traveling evangelist. Uh, you know, a traveling evangelist can come in, and uh, our church had that growing up, and that evangelist would come and, and could kind of like breathe fire, you know, come in and preach the paint off the walls, breathe fire, step on toes, and then leave. But someone had to stay behind and kind of sometimes clean up the mess a little bit. That's the pastor, right? The prophet was kind of like that. The prophet could come in and deliver the message, uh, crush some toes, you know, say, thus saith the Lord, and then the prophet could move on. The prophet could go. But a priest was different. A priest lived with the people. A, a priest couldn't just come and sort of stomp on toes and move to the next town. The priest was compassionate. The priest was in touch with the messiness of people's lives. If you were sick and you needed someone to pray for you, it wasn't the prophet necessarily who would come to pray. It was the priest. If you uh, wanted to make a, a, an offering for your sins, you had messed up really bad and you needed to make a sacrifice for your sins, it was a priest who lived with you, was in touch with your weaknesses, who could be compassionate and, and serve and, and live a, amongst you. And so a priest was, <clears throat> was involved with the messiness of people's lives. A, a, a priest was a representative of God living amongst a sinful people. And folks, <clears throat> in that way, Jesus is a great high priest. He represents God to the people. We, we celebrate at this time of year the incarnation where God lives among us, takes up flesh, becomes one of us. He, and Jesus is God's representative to the people. He is the one who embodies, who lives amongst uh, the people. And we know that he is the exact, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 tells us this, that he is the exact expression of the nature of God. He is the one who is representing God to us. Now, think about how he does that, though, because he, he, he represents God to us in a way unlike any Old Testament priest. So let me give you an example of something I'm, I'm sure you probably all woke up this morning thinking about. Leprosy. Um, let's say that you were an Israelite and you woke up one morning and you had leprosy. Now, the, the Old Testament has a very specific procedure for you. If you wake up and you have leprosy, you have to move out of your home you have to move away from your family. You actually have to move out of the city because you are now unclean. 
And so you would go to a leper colony outside the camp of Israel. So just imagine it today. You wake up, you got leprosy, you got to move away from your family, you got to leave your home. Not only do you have to leave your home, you have to leave Amarillo. You know, like you'd have to go to Hereford or somewhere um, outside the camp, right? And there you would be, a leper among lepers. And you're unclean. You're no longer welcome with the people. And in the Old Testament, what you would do in that Old Testament period, if somebody would be walking by the road and they'd be coming close to the leper colony, the lepers had a responsibility. And that was to let you know that they had leprosy. So they would cry out, unclean, unclean. And then you just pass by them. Now, if by some miracle of God, you happen to be healed from your leprosy, and that wasn't totally unheard of. The Old Testament also has a procedure for you. In fact, you can read it. I know Leviticus is one of your favorite devotional books. Uh, you can read about this in Leviticus chapter 14 this afternoon on your own time, but there's a procedure. If you have leprosy and then somehow you get healed, what you would do is you would go and present yourself to a priest. And that priest would examine you. He would look you over. He would inspect you to make sure that you had indeed been healed from leprosy. And then there's a procedure. He would take this mixture and he would anoint you. He would sprinkle you with this uh, 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 mixture that he would create. And he would pronounce you to be clean. And then you could come back into the camp. You could move back home. Um, imagine what a surprise it would have been if you're walking along with Jesus one day and a leper, first of all, <clears throat> comes up to Jesus. You remember this story in the Gospels? A leper comes up to Jesus. Now, that's already a big mistake because lepers are not supposed to come close to clean people. Lepers are supposed to scream out, unclean, unclean. But a leper comes up to Jesus one day. Can you imagine being one of the disciples? I mean, you're like, you want to talk about social distancing, right? Like six feet perimeter or whatever. Somebody with leprosy comes up. You don't want to be anywhere close to them. You certainly don't want to touch them because if you touch a leper, then what happens? You get leprosy. You touch an unclean person, you become unclean. But imagine the surprise when Jesus looks at that leper. And unlike the Old Testament priests who would have said, you know, you get, get outside the camp. I'll inspect you out there. I'll sprinkle you. I'll anoint you if you've been healed. But Jesus doesn't do that. What does Jesus do with the leper who comes to him? He gets close and he touches him. Instead of Jesus becoming unclean, the leper becomes clean. Instead of Jesus getting leprosy, the leper becomes healed. And folks, that is something no Old Testament priest would have ever done. You don't get close to a leper. You don't get close to somebody unclean, but Jesus did. And you see, that's how he is our great high priest. He is the one who represents God to the people. Think about the representation of God's character in that moment. Jesus is showing us that God is a God who gets close to us in our most unlovely moments. When anyone else in society would reject you, when anybody else would say, oh, that's an unclean person, they need to go out, our God is the kind of God who gets up close to us. And Jesus shows us that as our great high priest if he sees you messy and dirty and guilty and shameful, he doesn't send you outside of the camp. He goes outside the camp to you and embraces you and touches you and makes you whole. So he represents God to the people. Now, that was a lot of time spent on a sub point, so I'll have to move a lot faster. He also represents the people to God. A priest would go to God on behalf of the people, and folks, isn't this what Jesus does for us as well? Think about this. How can he represent God to the people? Well, because he is God. How can he represent the people to God? Because he was human. And the Bible uses all kinds of words to describe what it means to represent people to God. It uses words like intercessor. In fact, the book of Hebrews uses that very word. If you just flip over a couple of chapters to Hebrews chapter 7, that very word is used to describe Jesus. If you look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, just look at what God's word says here. It says, therefore, he is able to save completely. This is Hebrews 7, 25. He's able to save completely those who come to God through him. Why? Because he always lives to what? Intercede for them. Jesus is our advocate. He is our representative. He is the one who goes to the Father on our behalf. Not only does he represent God to us, he stands before God for us. He represents God the people to God. 
But then the, the third thing, I told you the priests represent God to the people. They represent the people to God. What was the third thing? Priests make sacrifices for the sins of the people. So all the priests would have responsibilities in this regard. They would make sometimes daily sacrifices. But the most important sacrifice that the priests would make was one day a year. It was called the Day of Atonement. And you can read about this in Leviticus chapter 16. I encourage you to do that sometime today. But Leviticus chapter 16 describes what would happen on one day of the year, one priest, the high priest, would go into the temple, would make a sacrifice for the sins of the people, would kill an animal, take some of that animal's blood, go into uh, what was called the holy place, And then there was a big veil, a thick veil, and behind that veil was a place called the Holy of Holies, which was where God's presence dwelt amongst his people. That high priest would take the blood of that animal, would pass through the veil, put that blood on the horns of the altar, and make atonement for the sins of the people. God the Father would look at the blood that was shed by an innocent animal And he would reckon that as a sufficient substitute for the sins of the people. And so this is what would happen. God would account the life of an innocent animal whose blood was shed on behalf of guilty people whose blood was not shed. In other words, an animal would die so that the people could live. God would look at the blood of that sacrifice And he would avert his justice for a year. He would not pour out all of his judgment on the Israelites for their sin because a substitute had died in their place in this animal. And so that was a very important day, the day of atonement, the high priest going in, making a sacrifice, making atonement for the sins of the people. But but folks, that was a temporary thing. It wasn't... It wasn't a forever sacrifice. It was an annual sacrifice. That priest would do it once a year. Day of atonement comes, puts off God's judgment for one year. The next year comes, the priest would have to do the same thing all over again. And and folks, this is where, again, we see that Jesus is a great high priest. Because like the Old Testament priests, he makes a sacrifice for our sin. But unlike the Old Testament priests, the Old Testament priests would take the blood of bulls and goats, and it was a once a year kind of a thing. Jesus goes, he doesn't make a sacrifice, he is the sacrifice. He gives his, his own life. He doesn't take the blood of bulls and goats. He sheds his own blood through his death on the cross and he makes atonement for our sins and his sacrifice is a once for all time kind of sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that the Old Testament priests would make sacrifices over and over and over again, but our great high priest makes one sacrifice for sins for all time, full, final, and forever. Jesus' sacrifice was better. It was sufficient. It was superior. And, And notice the language of verse 14 because this is so rich. Just like the Old Testament priest, the high priest would pass through the veil, right? Pass through the veil to go into the Holy of Holies. What does the text say about Jesus? He's our great high priest. It's no accident that the author uses this phrase, who passes through. The author is saying here, he's referring to the death of Christ. When Christ dies, it's as if he passes through the veil to make atonement for our sin. And so I'm telling you, we have a priest who saves. That is how Jesus can save us because he rescues us from our sin. He pays the price through his own shed blood for our sin. He can save us from the wrath of God. He can save you from your sin because he is a great high priest who has sacrificed himself for you. But not only that, not only did he die on the cross and offer a sacrifice, we know the rest of the story, right? The story doesn't end on Good Friday in a tomb. What happens on Sunday? Jesus comes back to life. He's raised from the dead. And then what happens? He spends 40 days with his disciples. What happens at the end of those 40 days? He ascends, right? He, he ascends into heaven, which is where he is now, seated at the right hand of God, enthroned, ruling, and reigning from heaven, from whence he shall come. 
right? We look forward to his second coming. Did, did you notice the language here in verse 14? The, the author of Hebrews doesn't just say that we have a great high priest who passed through. He says he has passed through the heavens. That language is intentional. The author is trying to get you to realize that not only has Jesus made atonement for your sin by passing through the veil, but he also passed through the heavens. That's a reference to his resurrection and his ascension. Now, why is it important that Jesus rise from the dead? Well, here, here's why. Because not only did Jesus take care of our sin through his death on the cross, through the resurrection, he took care of the penalty for sin. What's the penalty of sin? Death, right? Romans tells us that. The wages of sin is death. By rising from the dead, Jesus not only took care of our sin, he took care of the penalty of our sin by defeating death through the resurrection, rising through the heavens, passing through the heavens, ascending to the right hand of the Father, which is where he ever leaves, le lives to make intercession for us. Folks, that's how Jesus can save us. He saves us not just from sin, but from sin's penalty, death by dying himself and then being raised to the dead, from the dead, ascending to the right hand of the Father. Aren't you thankful for that? That's a truth about Jesus. Now, how should we respond to it? Right, verse 14 is a truth. He is a great high priest, the Son of God, who has passed through the heavens. But now look in verse, the, the second part of verse 14 gives us an invitation. Let us hold fast to our confession. The author is saying, not, not only did Jesus pay for our sin, but he, he defeated death. He took care of the penalty of our sin. He passed through the heavens. The proper response to that is to hold fast to your confession of Christ. Remember, he's writing to this church. They're in the fourth quarter. They're ready to quit. And he's saying, look at Jesus, look at this great high priest. He represents God to you. He represents you to God. He makes a sacrifice for your sins. He saves you. And in light of what Jesus does for you, don't quit. Don't let go. Instead, hold fast to your confession of Christ, who you confess Jesus to be. Cling to that. Cling to Christ. Hold tight to Christ. Don't let go. Don't shrink back in faith. <laughs> no, instead, hold fast. Endure in your faith. Don't let go of Jesus. Don't drop your confession. Cling tightly to Christ. That's the proper response to Jesus' work. If you are thinking about throwing in the towel, then consider our great high priest who saves and hold tightly to your confession of him. Now, here's the beautiful truth that we know from Scripture. We're called to hold on to Jesus, but the Word tells us he is also holding on to us. If you've uh, ever been on one of those old, broken-down kind of roller coasters, which they all seem like they used to be old and broken down, you remember the old, like, bar, the little metal bar? You'd just get in that rickety roller coaster, you'd sit down, you got the seat belt that doesn't ever snap, but you got that metal bar and you pull it, right? Click, click, and you always want to click it one more time till it's like squeezing the life out of you, right? Because you don't want to fly out of this thing. So click, you're right, so you're locked in. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm on those rickety old roller coasters, I am hanging on tight to that bar. But the truth is, it's, it's holding on to me. And it is its hold of me that's going to see me safely through. Now, I'm still going to hold on to it, aren't I? <laughs> but it's holding on to me. And folks, we are called to hold to Christ, but we do that in the realization he is holding on to us. Jesus not only saves us, he also keeps us. He not only redeems you, he preserves you in faith. And so you are called to hold on to the one who is holding on to you. You are called to, to cling to the one who is clinging to you. The author is saying, don't let go of the one who won't let go of you. Hold fast to your confession. See this great high priest who saves and hold on tight to the one who's holding on tight 
to you. Amen? Now, here's the second truth. I'm going to have to move about 100 times faster. Not only do we have a, a priest who saves, but the second truth about Jesus that we see in this text is that we have a priest who sympathizes. Now, look at verse 15 and 16. Verse 15 is terrible English, right? In English class, you were taught never to use a double negative. Well, you have that in verse 15. He uses a double negative. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. So how do we state that positively? You have a double negative. You can state it positively. You could say it like this. We do have a priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Folks, I want to tell you the good news that should help motivate you to continue running the race of your faith is not only do you, that you have a great high priest who will save you, but you also have a great high priest who will sympathize with you. This word sympathy is a beautiful word. It means to feel with, to feel with. Um, when you are sick, you want a doctor who has the ability to sympathize, right? Somebody who can feel your pain, who feels with you, who, who tries to understand what you're going through. You don't want a doctor who is kind of cold, you know, especially if he has to uh, deliver bad news. You don't want that doctor to come in and her to say, you know, it's all in your head. You're fine. Toughen up. <laughs> You'll be okay. You, you want someone who can sympathize with you, who can feel your pain. That's exactly what the text says that Jesus does for us. He sympathizes with us. He feels with us. Now, here's an important clarification. One scholar said about this uh, word sympathize is that it, it's, it's not psychological, but existential. And what that means is simply this. It doesn't merely mean that Jesus feels bad for you or takes pity on you, but that he actually feels with you. And there's a difference, right, between just feeling bad for somebody and actually feeling with them. Th this text is telling us that when you go through temptation or pain, Jesus doesn't merely feel sorry for you. He actually experiences your pain alongside of you. He actually suffers with you. That's what it means for Jesus to sympathize. Now, let's just think about that for a moment because think about the picture of Jesus that we have in the book of Hebrews. He is the exalted son of God. He is the one who is enthroned in heaven. He is the one who is the exact expression of the very character of God. Theologians use the word transcendence. What that means is that God is big, and you want a God that is big, a God that is high and lofty and exalted and, and above us. That's what it means for God to be transcendent. But there is another truth about who God is, and that is not just his transcendence, that he's high and lofty and lifted up, that all of those things are true, but also God is what theologians call imminent. That means that he is near. He's close to us. He, he's not just a God who sits in the heavens and doesn't ever listen to us or can't ever understand us. He, he's not just the, the God who's big and far away. He's also the God who comes near to us. Isn't that what we celebrate at Christmas time with the incarnation? God taking on flesh. Jesus, although he sits high, comes low. Jesus, although he is exalted, empties himself and comes near and this text is teaching us this, that Jesus is not only the great high priest who passes through the heavens and is seated on the throne, but he is also the one who comes close to us in our weakness, who comes close to us in our pain and feels with us. He sympathizes with us in our weakness. He's not just far away, he's near. Aren't you thankful for that? Now, how can he sympathize with us? How can he feel with us? Well, look at the text we have a high priest who's able to sympathize with our weaknesses. <clears throat> Why? Because he has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Jesus never sinned, amen? Always perfect, never disobeyed God, never rebelled against the Father, was perfectly obedient. And yet, 
experienced every kind of temptation that we experience. If you think about uh, the wilderness temptation, for instance, in the Gospels, when Jesus is out there fasting in the wilderness for 40 days and Satan comes and tempts Jesus, think about the kinds of temptations that Satan used. It's the same kind of temptation that Satan tempts us with. <clears throat> First John says that Satan tempts us with three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, Okay. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life. Do you know that Jesus was tempted in all three of those ways in the wilderness temptation? Lust of the flesh. Jesus, uh, Satan comes to Jesus and says, hey, are you hungry? That's a temptation of the flesh. Are you hungry? Turn these br- stones into bread, right? Jesus experienced the temptation of the flesh. Um, how about the lust of the eyes? Uh, uh, Satan brings Jesus up to the top of the temple. He says, look at all of the kingdoms of the world. All of this could be yours if you'll just worship me, right? That's the temptation of the eyes. Look at all of this. How about the boastful pride of life? Throw yourself down from the temple. If you're really God, you know, angels will come and catch you before you land. That's an appeal to pride. Jesus was tempted in every kind of way as we are. And here's what that means. It means when you're going through temptation, when you're going through weakness, when you're going through struggle, you have a great high priest who understands experientially what that is like. You come to a priest. When you, listen, when you're in temptation and you come to Jesus Jesus is never going to look at you and sort of say like, man, why can't you just get it together? Like, why do you keep going through this? Why do you keep, I don't understand why you can't just be good. (laughs) Jesus is never going to do that to you. He is going to sympathize because he understands experientially what it is like to be tempted. That's why it's important for him to have been human. He understands. If you're going through loneliness, Jesus understands what loneliness was like. If you're going through, if somebody's betrayed you, Jesus knows what it is like to be betrayed. If you are having a hard time paying the bills, you're poverty stricken and and, and don't know where the next meal is going to come from, Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. Every kind of suffering, every kind of temptation that you go through, Jesus himself has experienced, yet without sin, which makes him a sympathetic priest. When you come to Jesus, you will not find the harsh words of an unloving, tone-deaf God who doesn't really know what you're going through. Instead, you'll find a sympathetic, gentle, great high priest who will say to you, I understand what that's like. I feel your pain with you. That's what it means for him to be near. That's what it means for him to be sympathetic. He understands. So we have a a priest who saves. We also have a priest who sympathizes. Now, how should we respond to that truth? Well, look at verse 16. What's the invitation? Look at it. Therefore, on the basis of the fact that we have a sympathetic high priest who understands our weakness, has been tempted in the same ways we have, therefore, on that basis, let us approach the throne. (laughs) What an invitation. Because we have a sympathetic Savior We're invited to approach the throne. Now, I want you to notice, don't don't miss this. The the word that he uses, some of you have a translation that says, let us draw near. How many of you have a translation that, that reads that way? Let us draw near to the throne. Now, that word choice is very intentional because that same term is actually used in the book of Leviticus, chapter 9 and verse 7, to describe the priests who would draw near into God's presence. The author of Hebrews is is lifting that term from Leviticus. And he's saying, in the same way that the Old Testament high priest would draw near into God's presence, now all of us, right, this kingdom of priests, which is what we are if we know Jesus, we are a kingdom of priests, we are invited to draw near into the very presence of God. 
We are invited on the basis of the fact that we have a priest who saved us, who's passed through the heavens, who, who is one who's sympathetic. On that basis, we are invited to draw near into the very presence of God. And by the way, notice how we are to draw near. What does it say in the text? Let us approach, let us draw near with what? Boldness. Some of you have the word confidence. Now, if you are a first century Jewish person reading this for the first time, this is blowing your mind because there is no such thing in the Old Testament as drawing near to the presence of God with confidence or boldness. You can't just sort of like waltz into the Holy of Holies, right? Only one person could go into God's presence on one day of the year, and that person goes with fear and trembling, but because of what Jesus has done for us, because of what Jesus has done for us, you and I, this kingdom of priests, we now have access into the very throne room of God, not with fear and trembling, but with great confidence. How can you be confident in the presence of Almighty God? How can you be confident in the presence of the one whose judging word will lay bare all humanity at the judgment? How can you approach the throne room with confidence? Here's why. You have a great high priest. And when you go into the presence of the Father, you are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. You can have boldness and confidence when you come into God's throne room because God does not see you in your failure, your mistakes, your sin, your shame, your guilt. God, the Father, looks at you and sees the righteousness of God, the Son. When you stand before God on that day of judgment, if you know Jesus, then you will be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, which means the righteous standing that the Son of God has, you will have in the presence of the Father which means you can boldly go into God's presence. No hesitance. Think about it. It's not limited to one person on one day of the year. Now, anyone can come into the presence at any time with confidence because of our great high priest and his work for us. Now, now notice, by the way, this, this word, this invitation, this command, draw near, it's in the present tense. You could translate it this way. Draw near and keep drawing near. Approach the throne and keep approaching the throne. That teaches us an important truth. You know that God doesn't ever get tired of you coming. I know that some people uh, like to screen their calls, especially millennials, we text, right? So somebody calls you on the phone, you see your phone ringing, and you're like, what's wrong? You know, what's wrong with this person? Why don't they text me? And you screen the call. God's never like that. <laughs> He'll never screen your call. He'll never say, ah, oh, I don't want to talk to them. Oh, they've messed up for the fifth time today. I'm tired of them coming. No, the text says, draw near, keep drawing near, keep coming to the presence of the Father with boldness. Come to the throne. Now, let's just talk about that throne for a second. If you were to describe the throne of God in light of verses 12 and 13, Verses 12 and 13, God's judging word will lay us bare, expose the thoughts and intents of the heart. If you had to describe God's throne, how would you describe it? Anybody want to give me a... David? Huh? Majestic. That's pretty good. Majestic throne. What else? Intense. Somebody else? Kind. Ooh, I like that one. Okay. Let's pause on that one. We'll come back. All right. What else? Yes. Loud. Glorified. Is that what you said? Okay. Glorified. Okay. What else? Humbling. Okay. What else? Loving. Okay. Let's hold that one. We've got kind and loving over here. Let's just hold that. Okay. Fearful. Okay. That's what I'm looking for. Right? Terrifying. Fearful. Humbling. What about kind and loving? How does the author of Hebrews describe it? It is a throne of grace. What a way to describe the throne of God. You know, there are a lot of thrones in history. Uh, Ivan the Terrible, the Russian, had an ivory throne. Uh, the Queen of Sweden had a silver throne. The Emperor of China had a dragon 
throne. That sounds inviting, doesn't it? The emperor of Sri Lanka had a stone throne. We have a throne of grace. And God's throne is not like other human thrones. Human thrones <clears throat> are elevated, right? They, 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 uh, they lift up the throne. You have to ascend a stair, staircase and you sit on the throne and you're kind of exalted. You, that way you can look down on everybody, right? Like that's one of the benefits of being a king or a queen. You just get to look down on people all the time. It's imposing, like a judgment seat. And we know if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, there is a judgment seat of Christ. You will stand before the one who will expose you and lay you bare. But if you know Jesus, God's throne is an inviting place. It's a throne where you're welcome. It's a throne where you are called into the presence of Abba, Father. It is a throne of grace. And what do you find when you come to that throne? Well, look at the last line of the, the verse 16. When you come to God's throne of grace, what do you get? Mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Mercy and grace, <clears throat> those are two sides of one coin. Mercy is God keeping from you what you deserve. What do you deserve? What do I deserve because of my sin? Death and judgment. Mercy is God holding back what we deserve, not giving us death and judgment. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Forgiveness, life, righteousness, holiness, the Holy Spirit, right? Newness. So when we come to God's throne room because of our high priest, our great high priest, Jesus not only are we saved from our sin, not only do we have a sympathetic high priest, but we are invited to approach God's throne where we will find both mercy and grace, God keeping from us what we don't deserve and giving to us, excuse me, keeping us from us what we do deserve and giving to us what we don't deserve, finding mercy and grace to help. <laughs> that throne of grace is a throne of help. It's a place where you can find the kind of help you need when you need it. That's why it says to help us in our time of need. Joel Gregory says that help is of no use if it's not on time. It'll do little good to have strength for tomorrow for the temptation of today. But God's help, God's grace is right on time. He is a right now God. When you come to his throne room, you can find help at your time of need. The Andrew Standard Version Help before it's too late. <laughs> Help before it's too late. Psalm 46 verse 1 says that our God is what? An ever-present help in time of trouble. Because of Jesus, our great high priest, we can be saved. He saves us. He also sympathizes with our weakness. And he invites us to hold fast to our confession of him, cling to the one who's clinging to you, and to approach his very throne room with boldness to find grace to help us when we need it. Aren't you thankful? If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I hope that today would be the day that you would approach. Today would be the day that you draw near and find the God of mercy and grace. If you've never made the decision to commit your life to Christ, after this service is over, I'm gonna be in the main hallway with a number of other pastors and would love to talk with you about how Jesus can forgive your sin, how he can make you new, how he can clothe you with his righteous standing, how you can be changed today. So once the service is over, just come and see me. Just say, I wanna know more about how to have a relationship with Christ. I would love to share that with you. If you are a believer in Christ, then hold fast. Amen? Don't give up. The game isn't over. Keep running. Hold fast to your confession and draw near to the throne again and again and again to find grace to help you in your time of need. Let's bow together. Father, we are so thankful for your word. Thank you for the comfort, the encouragement, the hope that it gives us. We thank you for the gift of Jesus 
We thank you for our great high priest who saves us and sympathizes with us. Thank you for the invitation to respond to him. Lord, I I do pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, that those of us in this room who know Christ, that we would hold fast, that we would not give up, we wouldn't throw in the towel, that we would cling to our confession of Christ. Lord, thank you that even as we cling to you, we know you're clinging to us. So we're called to hold on to you, you're holding on to us. We're thankful for that. Lord, help us to draw near to you in times of temptation and weakness and struggle and pain. Instead of pulling back, shrinking away, turning aside, let us draw near. We thank you for the throne of grace. We pray this in Jesus' good name. Amen. Let's stand together this morning. We're going to sing one final song of worship to King Jesus.